Ah, uh, what is your take on that? I mean, yes, and to quote you again, <laughs> if I may be so audacious, uh, to quote you again, you were telling us, I mean, that, and which is correctly so, that no literature or no work of art can exist in a vacuum. And we sustain it through the years, through our cultural conditioning, through whatever we've read, our own positionalities and prejudices. Yeah. But at the end of the day, when we talk about Cicero and all the others, uh, you know, classicists, and all those, the grand work that we've written, and I quote extensively from media, because, you know, yes, she's been one of those persons whom I can actually relate to, and what she did to Jason was debatable. That's another topic. But there are literature that, you know, that have taken in from them, that most of us at this age, and our millennials for that matter, mm -hmm. can relate to. So, yes, I would not ask you to negate classics at all, because that is where we derive everything from. But why don't we actually put in that kind of an emphasis on the current day literature that is being written, both in vernacular and in other languages, or for English for that matter? Yeah, it's, a, it's a very good question. Um, I don't know. I mean, the, my response would be genre. I suppose when you think of postmodern works, you're thinking it's a rejection of something else. That's what kind of defines postmodern work. They're changing themselves or rejecting something. Uh, from what? And I think that's, that's an important question to answer. So if you're reading late authors, postmodern, post postmodern, whatever may come, it's either going to be an engagement with something that already exists or a rejection of it. And in either case, you need to read what's come before, whether or not you enjoy work that comes before postmodern or you enjoy postmodern per se. If you were to hand someone in a vacuum, this is a work of literature, read it, what do you think? Ask them a question about genre. How would you describe this work? They won't know how. They'll have to think, well, what do I know of other genres, other literature? What, what shape does it take in other ways? And once they have a broader, broader perspective, a broader vision of what literature is more generally. Introspection, you mean? Yeah, introspection or even extrospection, I suppose. It's seeing what kind of books are out there. I mean, if you were to read a fantasy novel, if you were to read Lord of the Rings without any, any understanding of you know, Celtic culture or, or fan fiction or you know, science fiction and so on, you would just read a work on its own, and how would you describe it? Is it epic in nature? Fantasy? Science fiction? Do we need to categorize it, or why can't we have an amalgamation of everything that we read to develop or to shape us the way that we think or the way that we perceive things? Well, I think uh, critical... That is, I think... I'm sorry to interrupt you. No, no, I think critical engagement with the text requires you to understand how it, how it fits, the, how the pieces fit in the puzzle. Any, uh, you can read a, any piece of literature uncritically. That's true. But if you want to read it with sophistication, then you, you need to be able to place it in relationship to other things that exist. But not in isolation. I not in agree. isolation. You know, I wouldn't agree if you tell me to read it in isolation. No, 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 no exactly. My, my, my whole thesis is that you need to, either a work of literature is going to engage with or reject something else. And whether it's rejecting or accepting, you have to be able to read a lot of different literature critically to appreciate the work. That's a very good question. Thank you. Stephen, how would you, how would you react that... Uh, I think, you know, it's, been, it's very tempting to blame... Uh, the tendency of being utilitarian at the doorstep of science. But hasn't the evolution and usage of language actually been very expedient and a very utilitarian kind of thing? Like the family of languages, you look at the current uh, bouquet of languages that is classified as Latin hmm. or related to Latin. I think most of them would think that Homer was a Brazilian footballer or something like that. You know. You look at the evolution of languages that has come off from Sanskrit. You know, it is, it is like the children not resembling the parents in any way. So I think the speed and the drift with which languages have actually evolved, that they have moved very far away from their roots. And science is just one of the factors, you know. I mean, with, with, with growing rates of unemployment and saturation in the IT sector, you know, I think your dissolution will science with have will perhaps happen take in past. That's the other thing. A couple of laymans will also take people away from science to humanities. The universities will look far more secure than the financial markets. That's that's the other way of evolution. But what do you think about the languages? You know, the way the languages have drifted apart and taken a very sort of, you know, a quick fix kind of fast food kind of approach. Mm -hmm. Is that not to blame more than 
competing with science? That's a very good question as well. Uh, is there a standard for language? Uh, well, I would, I would argue no. Uh, language is what people use it to be. And um, we might study Latin, and I might say this is the right way of writing this word, but there might have been many school children who wouldn't have written it that way, but Cicero did. And, Cicero, and that's what's come down to us. So we make a lot of artificial rules for the, the study of the classical languages. Um, and Latin and Greek was very messy, and it continued to evolve as well. There was a lot of Koine Greek, for example. Um, there's a lot of dialects of Latin that existed that we just don't have a record of. And so while there might have been many, many branches, only very few have actually existed to come down to us. From Latin and the branching out of French and Italian, uh, later the mutation of this weird language, English, uh, all of these things are again starting to draw together because it's no longer geographically limited. Language is now universal, that we speak it on the internet and can be heard across the globe. So I think languages are very rapidly disappearing at the moment. Could we have a few feedbacks from your students? Who are exposed to the uh, by all means, yeah. I'm trying to think of. Oh, I, I was going to have another question. Oh right. Okay. Uh, <laughs> what, did you, what did you mean by feedback from the students? Uh, I mean, though, though, though they happen to be in your presence, let them tell us what they make of. I'm trying to think who the classes is. What war was the classes is? Yeah. Odell, ancient history. No, I don't. I don't. I, war hope. What do you think my class is going? <laughs> So you want his opinion on how, what he thinks of me. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> Make me look good, Warhope. Make me look good. <laughs> what do you get out of the classics? Uh, I... It's hard to... Stunned silence. Uh, it's hard to qualify. It's hard to quantify. Um... <laughs> um so with classics, I, um, I will, as Dr. Kennedy said, if you want to look at anything with the, with the humanities, you need to start with classics. Um, all the foundations of philosophy, as he has said, start um, within classical philosophy with the likes of Plato and Aristotle. Um, and the languages in themselves, especially Greek, I find to be almost more eloquent and more beautiful than the languages or English that I speak fluently. Um, and so while I have a limited understanding for them, um, I can still recognize their beauty and I can still recognize um, their natural flow. And so it means that if um, I ever get as good as, as, a, as good at Greek as someone of Dr. Kennedy's caliber, I can finally recognize the true, full beauty of the language. I wrote, I wrote that down from earlier. Yes. <laughs> that Harrison. This is going to be counterpoint. Um, this is going off on a bit of a tangent because I don't actually study classics under Dr. Kennedy. He should. Uh, he should. Um, <laughs> but on on the use of language and how it can kind of encapsulate how people think. Uh, there was a study from Harvard which looked at uh, Nigeria, I think it was, and they have something like 32 na uh, different words with shades of green, whereas here we just have one. And they were given a test whereby they had a circle with 12 shades of green and one slightly different and not perceptible to me. And then another one with all green and one, uh, all 11 uh, green and one blue. And uh, almost all of them picked the green circle before the Blue, uh, for the, the other circle with the blue one in it, which I, I think is a good example of how language can capture things in a different way. Yeah, that, that's an interesting study actually, it was more recently on psychology of language, and um, this again is, is still not largely proven, but there have been studies, like you said, that um, the way we physically see the world is shaped by the language with which we think. And if that is true, then the studying of Latin and Greek will let you see the world in a different way. I should have made that point. Yeah. Thank you. So, um, if I can just speak on a from a, a utility point of view, because um, that's something that I think people always overlook about classics. And when I'm talking about classics, I'm going to 
talk about um, Greek and Latin just for 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 this um, mini speech. But um, <laughs> it's it, <laughs> um, but but I'm sure it works as well with with Sanskrit and, and other languages. Um, is is purely the the grammar of of Latin and Greek. Um, having done having done a bit of Latin and a bit of Greek, um, I think it it gives you the basis to learn. Every other language. We we had a class today with with Bengali when we got taught for forty minutes a bit a bit of Bengali. Um, I didn't understand much, but if, if there's if there's one thing I, I understood is it's it's the grammar of there's no definite article, um, there's no um, there's no indefinite article, and um, for plurals you can add endings and, uh, and and certain things like that, which I think you only see. Um, if you study a language like Latin or Greek, where there is so much emphasis on the grammar, on the on, on certain order of words and and how speech is structured, um, so and especially for European languages like Portuguese, like Spanish, like Italian, um, like French, um, like Romanian, that are so closely linked to Latin, they have such a directly um, such a, an intricate link with it that it just gives you um, it makes it so much easier to learn those languages. So. I often, when people say, oh, learning classics isn't useful because um, it's not directly useful um, in a world where progressively we're more um, concerned by immediate results, I think that, yeah, I, I would contradict that point and say that actually they're very useful um, if you want to communicate with, with other people. And I think communication, as Mr. Dolan said, is one of the most important um, Factors in, in understanding each other. Um, so, yeah. He may have snuck in a nice compliment at the end there, but he, he doesn't realise there's a Bengali exam tomorrow and he hasn't studied for it just yet. Um, there's so much that I've been interested in your talk, and I'd love to talk about alt right and um, the alliteration yes, with, yeah. with the ancient world. Because uh, I'm a bit of a political weeds, but I'm not because unfortunately Harry paid me to do debating, so I'm sort of obligated to, to talk about that. Um, so one of the things that you talked about is that by translating Cicero, Cicero, you learn two things at the same time. You learn how to approach rationalism, but also how to make that rationalism beautiful and impactful and emotional. And in debating, we often use the term winning hearts and minds because some people are persuaded by one thing and some people are persuaded by other things. I was wondering if you could give any hot tips from the ancient world on debating on how we can win hearts and minds a bit more. Oh, before you go, actually, I thought you actually used a better term than hearts and minds, intelligent sympathy, to be able to think critically about a topic while engaging with it emotionally at the same time. Intelligent sympathy, I'm going to remember that. Right, so the, the Cicero's top three uh, ways of persuading an audience. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a difficult one. There are several works by him specifically on this topic. So he wrote a lengthy work called De Oratore in three parts. He wrote another one called Orator. Um, the first way of learning how to speak persuasively is to find a good example to follow. Uh, and a Roman education, it was very different from our own way in which you have a single teacher, um, you have a, a kind of classroom of, of boys, and I talk to them about these things. But Cicero, as a boy, was kind of handed over to a leading lawyer at the time, so kind of like job shadowing. And that's what they would do. He would, he would go to the courts. And we'd follow this example, and people would say, this man is someone to copy. Uh, do what he does, because it works for him. And so Cicero would do that. Cicero would go and, and watch this man perform, take his notes. And then, of course, when he would go home in the evening, he would read, well, I wouldn't have argued it that way. I would have written it this way. And so he would see a model. Uh, he would copy that model, and then he would say, okay, well, how would I have done it differently? And I, you know, he would read through his Demosthenes and his Lysias and Isocrates. So he would do the practical side, and this is, this is the second point, is find a good model, and then do both the practical and the theoretical. Um, uh, thirdly, practice. And Cicero does this all the time. Uh, there's, a very, there's a very famous speech in, in Veres, in which he is prosecuting this very famous governor of Sicily who was effectively extorting the people of Sicily. So the people of Cicero went to Cicero and said, you have to defend us from this man. And so Cicero wrote this enormous speech, probably would have been about three to four hours long in delivery, 
He wrote the whole thing and very s ran away. <laughs> so even before delivering this, he wrote it out and then said, well, I don't want to waste it, so I'll go back and I'll publish it. And he wrote it again a third time. Uh, and we have, strangely, different copies of the three different introductions. So when you get this beautiful speech from Cicero that's finely polished, it hasn't just appeared out of nowhere. This is a man who has obviously sweat to the lamp uh, late into the evening, kind of cramming his speech. Um, so yeah, find a good model, focus on the practical and the theoretical, and rewrite, rewrite, rewrite. Uh, this is an amazing lecture which I have heard. Uh, I know the uh, classic is related with ancient work and intrinsic beauty and it is related with humanity. So uh, in the colloquial language, call, uh, every, anyone can talk that it's a classical works in culture or in classical writing you have written. So I have a question, is there, uh, in the classical way, is there time limit? Which time we can call classic, and which yeah. time we can call modern, or uh, and, and contemporary, and, and uh, in our culture, there are, uh, in the dance form, and in the every culture, there are uh, ancient culture, and classic, uh, classic is, Classic dance, yes. uh, folk yeah, dance, right. yeah, yeah. and also modern and contemporary work. So I want to know, there, is there any time limit of to be called as classic? That, that's, that's a great question, and, and it's the great unknown. That, that's a question that's been debated fiercely from, from many different sides. When does the classic work become classic? You know, does the author have to be dead for 10 years now? It, it's, I mean, there's a lot of living authors who are declared to be classics while they're still alive. So Bob Dylan was classical, you know, even he was still singing the music that he wrote 20 years ago, he was still, you know, he's still considered classic. Homer, again, probably not an instant classic, but it was so fundamental to the culture that Homeric diction was considered to be, you know, a high register, poetic register. And if you read Shakespeare, you, you know that Shakespeare is probably not the language most people spoke on the streets. So there are different registers. But what's to say a low register couldn't also become a classic? And this is one author I didn't really talk about much, but there's a, a Roman playwright called Plautus who wrote these silly plays, they're comedies. You know, uh, there's a silly slave who tries to you know, pull a fast one on his Roman master and marry off the son to the next door girl who he's in love with and all sorts of stuff. It's very uproarious, it's very, very silly. But there was a Roman senator who famously said, if the Roman gods spoke Latin, they would speak in the language of Plautus. And Plautus spoke common Latin. And Plautus was a classic. So it's hard to say, you, you have classics that are very high register, and you have classics that are very low register. You have classics that take a long time to be a classic. Uh, Catullus went out of favor. It stopped being a classic, came back into favor to become another classic. So there's so many different options there. that It's a great question. It's a fun one to think about. But I don't know if there's an answer. I, I, I hope that gives you something to think about. Can we please end with a hat trick? There's a hat Daniel again. trick? <laughs> right. You will ask a question? Yeah. Sit and get the last one. Yeah. Um, do, you, do you think the study of classics, or just like classics in general of the topic, um, do you think it has had like an impact on music or, you know, the... Um, the musical periods and how it evolved over time, but just like music in general, because I know there's a lot of like composers that took the ancient myths, like Greek mythologies, and with those stories, they you know put the music over over that, and they performed as like operas or you know. Yeah, it's a, think, it's a great question. We don't really think about it, but Greek tragedy was very operatic. I mean, we we like to think of it now as kind of a stuffy text in which great men deliver soliloquies on stage, and every once in a while there's a oi moi, you know, alas me. Um, but it would have been very, it would have been a, a weird combination. Greek tragedy was a bit of ballet, a bit of opera, and a, a bit of speech giving. Uh, and there's an uh, there's a an academic at Oxford, Professor Armand Dengour, who's working on reconstructing Greek music. And we do have inscriptions, a very very rare, but we do have inscriptions in which Greek text is written out in Greek meter as we know it, and above each of the uh, kind of syllables is a tone. 
So you can sort of reconstruct a sense of music that would have been associated with lines of poetry. And he has done this with funding from the Dino Laventis family that he has actually reconstructed using the pipes uh, and the harp what Greek music would have sounded like. And it's sort of like a, like a musical. You know, there would be speaking parts, which the narrative moves forward, and then there is the dramatic song that kind of stirs up the audience. And, you know, and that's 500, 600 BC. And so the evolution of that to the modern musical, the modern opera. Opera, I think, is very, the modern operas, in a sense, are very distinctly Italian. But I think you could probably trace their origins back to Greek tragedy. Or just simply bar songs. I, I don't know. There's a little bit of that. Right. Well, thank you very much. I hope that answers most of the questions. Dr. Kennedy, for so passionately standing on your feet for what's like almost two hours. Thank you so very much. Thank you so, so very much. We know what a heavy day this has been for you. And, and yes, after the long day, thank you very much for this talk. Uh, to this lovely audience, thank you for being as participative as you've been. Well, we could have taken questions till midnight, but then the day has to come to an end. Um, I must put on record Calcutta Debating Circle's gratitude to the Victoria Memorial Hall, to Dr. Sen Gupta.